Managing bone stress injuries can be tough. Warden et al. released a clinical commentary discussing key principles. Hi and welcome back to PhysioTutors. Low risk bone stress injuries occur often at the tibia and metatarsals. Compressive forces lead to issues at the posterior and dorsal parts respectively. These two sites account for more than half of the bone stress injuries combined. These injuries are deemed low risk since they heal without invasive treatment or complications. However, recovery can take quite long. Be aware, principles discussed in this video do not carry over to high risk sites such as the femoral neck due to a higher risk of progression. Healing comes down to the first principles of bone metabolism. Osteoclasts remove damaged bone and osteoblasts fill the void. The injury occurred by load breaking down and outpacing the remodeling cycle. Low risk bone stress injuries thus require a period of relative rest while not resulting in deconditioning of the tissues. There is no need for a period of strict protected weight bearing, but it is paramount that the periods of load are symptom free during, after and the day following the load. Any pain means that the load should be modified. The initial goal of rehab is pain-free daily living and walking. This might be achieved with assistive devices. Minimalist shoes increase tarsal load, so avoiding these might help in the acute phase of metatarsal bone stress injury. When night pain or pain and rest is present, ANSATs can be used for less than seven days. Prolonged ANSAT use may reduce bone formation. Athletes taking relative rest during bone stress injuries might maintain their fitness level with the use of low impact alternatives such as cycling, swimming or other forms of cross training. Specific modifications may be needed to avoid provocation. Bone stress injuries are prospectively associated with reduced muscle size and strength. Train local muscles near the injury but make sure more distant ones are not neglected by disuse. Think of calf raises, leg presses, intrinsic foot muscle training and multiplanar hip training, etc. Gradually replace low load training such as swimming with progressively loading the limb by elliptical training, bodyweight supported treadmill running to eventually over ground running. A progressive walk run program can be started. Running can be initiated if the athlete has five consecutive pain free days. The authors argue that it's theoretically safer to increase volume first rather than intensity. You can monitor load with running time and speed and steps per day. So who's at risk here? Prior bone stress injuries greatly increase the risk of subsequent injury. Female runners with a BMI less than 19 and delayed menarche or amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea are at a twofold risk of developing a bone stress injury. Bone cells might find repetitive loading during running boring and become mechanically deaf for this load. A progressive jumping program might therefore mitigate the risk of subsequent injury. You should focus on explosive takeoffs rather than heavy and you might need to replace one running session with low load training such as swimming to incorporate the jump training safely without overloading the patient. A final tip is increasing the cadence of the runner by 5-10%. to 10 This can reduce the risk of future tibial bone stress injuries and it might even help with managing symptoms too. Adopting a forefoot strike pattern will not decrease these loads. That's it for this video. If you're interested in running rehab, make sure to check out our online course with Benoit Matthew. The link is in the video description. I'm Max for Physio Tutors and I will see you in another video. Bye.